this video, I'm going to talk about pulmonary hypertension. So before we start, what's the definition of pulmonary hypertension? Well, to, to really talk about that, let's go back to the basics of the pulmonary circulation. So if this is the heart, right, this is going to be the right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. All right, so coming off of the right ventricle, you're going to have the pulmonary, pulmonary arteries. So pulmonary hypertension is really defined based on the pressure inside here. So normally, there's a mean pulmonary arterial pressure. Normally, it should be greater than or equal to 20 millimeters of mercury. In pulmonary hypertension, this value is elevated. So in pulmonary hypertension, this value is greater than or equal to 25 millimeters of mercury. Now, of course, in between 20 and 25, experts don't really know what to call that. They say it might be a risk factor for developing pulmonary hypertension, so those patients are people to watch. So this is how it's defined. And there are multiple types of pulmonary hypertension. A lot of different things can cause it. And it's broken down into groups. And the groups are one through Five, and they each have different uh, etiologies associated with them. So I'm going to use uh, I'm going to use regular numerals because Roman numerals are longer to write. But the way they're broken down is the following. So they're broken down based on whether it's pre-capillary or post-capillary etiology. So the way I think of it is, here's an alveolus. So this is one unit of, you know, one unit of the lung, air comes in here, comes out here, there's gas exchange across the membrane. And to each alveolus, there's a blood supply, right? So there's an artery, or an arteriole, I should call it, because it's small at this point. And it branches into this capillary bed, which I kind of think of it, goes across the alveolus, and there's gas exchange between, you know, there's, there's a change of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the air and the alveolus and the blood and the capillaries. So the different groups of pulmonary hypertension kind of go along, you know, each spot here. So. The pre-capillary etiologies are going to be groups one, three, and four. The post-capillary is going to be group two. And then you'll see how that's broken down in a minute once I talk about the separate etiologies. Now, group five kind of can, can be anywhere, and you'll see why in a second. So how are these groups you know, what, what are these groups specifically? So going down the list, let's talk about them this way. So one, two, three, four, five. So group one, number one, is gonna be like the number one pulmonary hypertension. It's gonna be pulmonary hypertension that kind of occurs by itself. So this is going to be, this is going to be like primary. pulmonary hypertension. So the second one is kind of the, the odd one out. And it's the odd one out, you see how it's, it's, it's the only one that really is post-capillary. So this one is due to cardiac disease. And specifically, left heart disease, left heart disease. Third, is going to be everything that's due to 
intrinsic lung disease. Four is going to be from thromboembolic disease. And five is everything else. That's kind of like the grab bag catch all one, and that's the one that you know no one really is sure of where it fits into. So each one of these different uh, types of pulmonary hypertension, there are different kind of etiologies that fall under each one of these different groups because you know multiple things can, can cause each one of these. So let's start with the first one. Let's talk about primary pulmonary hypertension. So Primary pulmonary hypertension, uh, the big class is the, the heritable. So let's start like this. Let's call it one is going to be primary pulmonary hypertension. So what are, what are things that fall under this? So primary pulmonary hypertension is the group where the hypertension is due to a problem with the vessels themselves. This isn't something that's a secondary change. It's actually, it's a vascular disease. That's why it's called primary pulmonary hypertension. So, or pulmonary arterial hypertension, I should say. So, what falls under this is, let's, let's start with heritable. Pulmonary arterial hypertension. So, this is uh, a mutation in the BMPR2 gene. It's inherited in the autosomal dominant fashion. And uh, what this essentially causes is it causes changes in the pulmonary arteries such that there's um, hyperplasia of the intimal layer and there's hypertrophy of the medial muscular layer. And that causes uh, uh, increased pressures to develop in these uh, uh, in the arteries leading to the alveoli. A lot of other things fall under this category. So, for example, drugs and toxins. These can cause pulmonary arterial hypertension, primary pulmonary hypertension. Uh, so, what are the big, you know, culprits here? So, one of the big ones is uh, this is not on the market anymore. But what's was known as fen, fen. This is a appetite suppressant, which was, uh, you know, it's an amphetamine derivative. So this is something that was associated with very high rates of, of this disease. Um, other things that fall under this class are amphetamines. Amphetamines, there's like, you know, St. John's Ward. You know, a lot of random, you know, toxins that fall under this. I think the big, big ones are appetite suppressants and amphetamines are, are huge for this. Uh, what else? So next, is uh, connective tissue diseases. So these are, you know, big diseases such as neuronally sclerodoma, but also rheumatoid arthritis and SLE can cause this. So the pathogenesis of this is that these connective tissue diseases cause fibrosis and hardening of the vessels themselves, which causes increased pressures to develop in these arteries. Uh, next would come the uh, congenital heart disease. So this is not related to group two. These are a separate, uh, separate class of diseases. Um, these are things that kind of develop in childhood, which cause left to right shunts of blood in the heart. So the way I think of it is, uh, you know, so let's say you have a very, very large, you know, VSD. Let's say you have a very large ventricular septal defect. So you have a ton of blood that's going from the left side of the heart to the right side of the heart. And what this causes is it causes increased pressures on the right than would normally be there. 
and that increased pressure gets transmitted all the way up to the pulmonary arteries. Now, if there's increased pressure going this way and it's constantly pushing on these arteries, eventually it's going to cause hypertension and eventually there's going to be a reversal of the shunt when the hypertension in the lungs gets high enough that the blood that's here says, well, you know, I used to take this path of least resistance, but eventually the pressure here, because of changes in the arteries that to accommodate that, you know, greater amount of flow are, you know, compounded enough such that the pressure here increases, the blood can't go up here anymore because the path of least resistance actually becomes this way. That's really, really bad. And that's indicative of pretty advanced pulmonary hypertension here. So, you know, things, anything that can cause like Eisenmenger syndrome essentially, which is what I just described. So, you know, very large VSDs, large ASDs, anything that causes shunting of blood from left to right, because eventually it'll be shunting from, from right to left. And the last group, or the last kind of big disease is HIV. So no one really knows why HIV causes pulmonary arterial hypertension, but the association is actually pretty significant. So something like one in 200 HIV patients is going to have pulmonary arterial hypertension. 